And this is now seminar 11, which is early life nutrition, the importance of nutrition before, during and after pregnancy. And I'm delighted that Jacqueline Loudon, who's a paediatric dietitian, is going to tell you all about it. So over to you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Um, I've got quite a lot to get through in the next 25 minutes, so I'm going to try and whiz through it as quickly as I can. Um, I've been asked to talk about, the, introduce the idea of the importance of early life nutrition as a major influence of health in later life. Also, the risk of non-communicable diseases and how risk can be reduced in later life through early intervention. Um, to touch on the first 1,000 days from conception to ad toddlerhood. And then looking at nutrition for preconception, pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, this is just a chart I wanted to put up about the Barker's hypothesis that I'm sure most of you will have um, read about or heard about, first introduced in about the 1990s. Um, it's been updated now and it's actually now been renamed the Fetal Origins of Adult Disease, otherwise known as FOAD, and the Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. And basically it's the importance of, highlights the importance of maternal undernutrition which can have an effect on fetal growth retardation all can then have effects on structural change within the organs of the growing foetus and this can result in poor childhood growth it can also result in metabolic and endocrine dysfunction and then presents later on in life with diseases later on so the Barker's hypothesis just emphasizing the importance of maternal undernutrition in the development of diseases in later life affecting the, the child so the importance of early life nutrition. Focus has always been on the perinatal undernutrition and specific nutrient deficiencies. Um, in particular, um, it's been highlighted the relationship between small size at birth and increased incidence of disease and later ad on in adult life. However, it's now being recognised that these higher instances of disease occur in both those born small and also those born large babies as well. So it's not just those who are small for dates, but also those that are born large at birth and um, can affect later health, life. So current global health crisis of overweight and obesity, perinatal overnutrition and specific nutrient excesses need to be examined. And we all know about the, the global um, effects of um, obesity in the world. And it's estimated that by 2030, up to 57.8% of the adult population will either be overweight or obese. So adding to the complexity of this dual burden of malnutrition is the influence of socioeconomic status. Um, and in developed countries, lower socioeconomic status is associated with a lower birth weight among the offspring of women and also in a higher prevalence of, obese, of obesity among women as well. So we're not you know, concerned about the obesity in mothers-to-be can also affect long-term outcomes in children in later life. And with this increase in world global obesity, that's of a huge concern. So welcoming to the first 1,000 days, um, they get the first 1,000 days because it's the number of days during pregnancy added to the first year of life and the second year of life, and it equates to 1,000 days. So that's where this term has arisen from. Um, just a, a nice um, picture really to show you about the high influence of environmental factors on later life health has 80% and genetic influence has 20% on the brain development, immune development, metabolic development. So a lot of people just think that your health is due to your genes, but as you can see there's a huge environmental effect can also play a part in health. So if we look at preconception and body weight, low body weight and obesity can affect fertility. Um, rates of infertility increase as BMI increases above 25. That's a, a normal healthy BMI is anywhere between 19 to 25. So above 25, you can affect in, in fertility and the relative risk of infertility increases below um, BMI of 20. So overweight, underweight can both affect fertility. Um, polycystic ovary syndrome is most common cause of anovulation and more common in obesity. And weight loss for that is the first line of treatment. But even a small amount of weight, so even a 5% weight loss can demonstrate a benefit. 
Um, but it's all about focusing on a nutrient, very rich diet and an active lifestyle for a gradual weight loss prior to conception. Um, Undernutrition and obesity can affect male steroid hormones as well, so not forgetting the men as well obviously have a huge important part to play in this. Um, and obesity because it reduces in, in insulin sensitivity and testosterone secretion. We also must also think about alcohol in preconception. Um, results to date are equivocal for alcohol and female fertility. Some studies show that it reduces female fertility and some suggest a dose response. Um, and some studies have shown no effect or only if you have a high um, level of intake. But what is known is that alcohol can be harmful for the fetus, especially in the early stages. The advice at present is to limit or avoid preconceptually, but we must also remember that breast milk production may be reduced by alcohol consumption. So during breastfeeding as well, it's probably best to reduce it or avoid it. Still looking at preconception um, and folic acid and neural tube defects, there is a well-established link. Um, Department of Health presently advise 400 micrograms a day from conception to the 12th week. Um, but all in the high-risk groups, they're recommending five milligrams a day, which is quite a substantial um, increase in that. And high-risk groups, they recommend those that have a family history of neural tube defects, offspring of parents with neural tube defects, um, women, with, women with diabetes, celiac disease, or who are on medication for epilepsy. However, we know that the use of supplements is poor, particularly in those in the socially disadvantaged and the ethnic minority groups. So the, the current advice is to encourage the supplements and also to try and um, consume a naturally rich sources in the diet. Rich sources in the diet, um, baked beans, poultry, um, home meal breads, um, green leafy vegetables, orange juice, and also some makes and brands of breakfast cereals are fortified with extra folate as well. Um, Mothers-to-be should take folic acid and vitamin B12, however, to prevent birth defects, leading experts warned back in 2012. This was a recommendation after a new report from Professor John Scott in, in Dublin. And he recommended that as well as the addition of folic acid supplement, um, adding in a B12 um, component, component would also br bring about further significance and a worthwhile risk reduction in neural tube defects. However, um, just this year, there's been an, a link with autism to the overdosing of folate in B12 during pregnancy. Um, and it was highlighted that taking too many folate supplements may double the chance of developing autism, while very high B12 could triple the likelihood of autism. And this was from a, a research in John Hopkins University in America. And they said that excess levels of both of these nutrients can increase the risk by 17.6%. However, the study has not been yet peer-reviewed and it's been condemned as being alarmist by other scientists who said to treat these results with caution. So what they're saying is that yes, excess amounts may cause harm, but what we're not aiming for excess amounts, we're just aiming for optimum levels. Moving on, another um, vitamin that's really important um, is iron. And we all know that iron requirements are increased during pregnancy. Um, anemia and iron deficiency can may be tackled pre-pregnancy um, to reduce the risks of poor maternal health and low birth weight babies. And NICE in 2008 um, recommended that iron supplements are not offered routinely, however. Um, they're saying that you should just investigate and supplement if indicated. However, um, there was a Cochrane review that was carried out last year looking at daily oral iron supplementation during pregnancy. Um, and they said that supplementing reduces the risk of maternal anemia and iron deficiency during pregnancy. And that it also has a positive effect on other maternal and infant outcomes. Um, you can be less clear. Um, in 2012, the routine iron folate supplement during pregnancy um, effect on maternal anemia and birth outcomes of a systematic review was um, published. 
um, they said that a routine daily iron supplement during pregnancy resulted in a significant reduction of 20% in incidence of low birth weight in the intervention group versus control. And so what they're saying is that preventative iron supplements made during pregnancy has a significant benefit in reducing the incidence of anemia in mothers and low birth weight babies. So the slide slipped down there. I just wanted also to put up um, a study there called the LIMIT and the Healthy Moms Trials. Um, this was investigating the impact of limiting weight gain in overweight and or obese pregnant women um, by looking at either dietary and lifestyle advice, so that was the LIMIT one, or looking at a weight management group intervention, and that was the Healthy Moms one, that was an American study. And what they found was, um, giving dietary and lifestyle advice, there was no difference in gestational weight gain. Um, between lifestyle advice and standard care, um, although there was an 18% reduction in macrosomia. In the Healthy Moms trial, they just used obese women. The intervention group gained an average of 3.8 kilograms less versus the control group. And they also had a, a reduction in large for gestational age infants, 9% um, as opposed to 26%. So although it's not yet proven, these interventions um, that prevent excessive um, gestational weight gain in overweight and obese women may be a promising strategy to try and reduce um, childhood obesity. Um, so it's something that's maybe ongoing. It's just wanted to highlight your attention there. You might want to have a look into more of the studies that are ongoing with the, those two trials, the LIMIT and the Healthy Moms trials. At the other end of the spectrum, looking at pregnancy and being underweight, 5% um, of pregnant women in the first trimester are underweight in England. That they means they have a BMI of below 18 and a half. Um, they have a less um, risk for gestational diabetes, as you might expect, and preeclampsia. However, they do have a significantly increased risk of developing anemia or being anemic, probably because they've got lack of a you know, poor diet having a preterm birth and also a small baby as well. So there are risks at the other end of the weight spectrum. Pregnancy and iodine, I wanted to highlight the importance of iodine. It's required to make thyroid hormones and help control metabolism. It also helps develop bone and brain development during pregnancy. Um, and it could affect the child's ability and IQ um, level later on in life. Um, there are iodine requirements per day. In adults, it's 150. Pregnant women, it's 200 micrograms. Breastfeeding women, it's 200. Um, an adequate concentration of iodine in breast milk is essential for creating optimal stores of neonatal thyroid hormone and preventing impaired neurological development in breastfed neonates. So it is a particularly important um, mineral there. Sources of iodine in the diet. Um, most people meet their needs if they're having a varied, well-balanced diet. Um, you can get it in things like shellfish, um, eggs, cheese, milk. Most protein-rich foods will have a, a good source of iodine. Um, those that are at risk, however, are those that avoid dairy and fish. So vegetarians and vegans would be at risk. Um, and soya milk is really fortified. Um, and we all, obviously we know as well that women have been drinking less milk over recent years. Um, and so many studies have shown that young, particularly young girls who don't drink milk may be deficient in iodine. So there are high risk groups to look out for that might be deficient in iodine. So should we then iodine supplement then? Well, um, the use of the forms of iodine supplement, potassium iodide or potassium iodate, um, those are the ones that are used. Um, as long as you don't exceed requirements, um, and don't use the seaweed kelp supplement because amounts can vary hugely from these values claimed on the labels and then you can then get excess amounts of iodine. Um, it's difficult to meet the higher recommendations in pregnancy and breastfeeding alone through diet. So it may be necessary to, to supplement an iodine if somebody you, you suspect is deficient or is at high risk of being deficient. Um, some multivitamin and mineral pregnancy supplements contain iodine, but if it does, then you're looking for about 140, 150 micrograms, and then the remainder could be met by diet. So that's what's the recommended amount to take if you're having, suggesting someone to take a supplement. If um, high dietary sources are consumed, then an iodine supplement might not be required. So if you've got someone who's good weight and they, you've got a healthy, well-balanced diet, then they shouldn't need it. Okay, I'm just moving on to fat intake and the importance of long-chain 
three fatty acids, um, especially one called docosahexaenoic acid, or DHA, as they like to prefer to call it. Um, sources of DHA in the diet, oily fish, egg yolks, and poultry. They're all really good sources. Fat intake is really important for brain development and, and retina development, so the eyes. Um, there is a higher requirement in pregnancy, but exact amounts are difficult to quantify. We just know it's increased. Some are evidence that seafood intake more than 340 grams a day will have a beneficial effect on child development. But that's a huge amount of seafood to eat in a day. You know, and, and, and it's not the sort of diet that we have in the UK. Um, higher intakes of, of these types of fats are also associated with longer gestation, higher birth weight and lower rates of postpartum depression. But you have to remember that these are also associated with the high levels of mercury intake, um, which um, you know, can be poisonous. So if you are having got someone who you're encouraging to have oily fish in the diet for more of your DHA or somebody that maybe has a high fish intake, we do recommend that you limit them because of the amount of the mercury toxicity. Um, it's what's suggested is tuna of more, no more than two tuna steaks a week or four cans a week maximum. Um, and that's maximum of two portions of oily fish a week. Avoid the fish oil supplements. Um, and a pregnancy DHA supplement can be taken if it does not contain retinol, because retinol is vitamin A and excess vitamin A um, can be toxic in a pregnancy. So it's making sure that we're taking the right one that's prepared for a pregnancy. As I said, vitamin A is toxic, um, so limit high vitamin A foods. That'd be things like liver, because um, liver is really high in vitamin A. And avoiding supplements containing retinol, including fish liver oils, because of the risk of vitamin A toxicity. Vitamin D, I could spend the rest of the day talking about vitamin D. Um, obviously, I wanted to include it because it's really, really important. Um, it's, not, it's been very recent that the health, chief medical officer has announced that everyone in the UK should be taking a vitamin D supplement. And it is particularly recommended for all pregnant and breastfeeding women, um, 10 micrograms a day. Um, women who are pregnant who have low vitamin D stores will produce children with even lower vitamin D stores. And, and we know that breast milk itself contains low vitamin D. Um, so breastfeeding mothers with low vitamin D levels will then provide even less um, vitamin D. And so that will, in fact, on the baby's vitamin D status as well as their bone health later on in childhood. So that message is really important to get pregnant and breastfeeding women their vitamin D supplement. Um, looking at some of the researchers out there, vitamin D status of breast and bottle fed infants and toddlers have found that there's low vitamin D status in 12% of infants um, and suboptimal in 40% of infants. And that breastfed babies that were not given a vitamin D supplement are 10 times more likely to be vitamin D deficient as compared to fully bottle fed um, infants. Um, and there's increasing evidence that even a mild vitamin D insufficiency can have a detrimental effect on bone health in children and particularly adolescent girls later on in life. So the important thing is that breastfeeding mums need to have that vitamin D supplement. There is a Cochrane review out there as well um, that you might want to look that was published this year. Um, it's showing that new studies provide more evidence in the effects of supplement from pregnant women with vitamin D alone or calcium. Um, and that supplementing pregnant women with vitamin D in a single or continued dose um, may reduce the, the risk of preeclampsia and low birth weight or prem births. Um, but when vitamin D and calcium are combined, the risk of preterm birth is increased. Um, it's sort of unclear why, um, but the clinical significance of increased vitamin D is still unclear. And the evidence on whether vitamin D supplements should be given as part of routine antenatal care to all women to improve maternal and infant outcomes is unclear. And that was the Cochrane review there. But since then, the chief medical officer has said that everyone would benefit from a vitamin D supplement. There are groups of women that are more likely to be um, vitamin D um, insufficient or risk of insufficiency. And those would be that are limited to exposure of sun. So women that are cover themselves um, if they've got poor diet with no meat, oily fish, eggs, margarine of the fortified breakfast cereals, because these are all good sources of vitamin D. And women that have come from South Asian, African, Caribbean, Middle Eastern origin because of their darker skin and tendency to cover themselves. And also we know that if your pre-pregnancy BMI is above 30, then you 
do have lower vitamin D bioavailability. The skin isn't able to convert the sun's rays into vitamin D as well as those who are of an, an ideal weight because of the layers of fat. Other vitamins in pregnancy, um, vitamin E, there was a Cochrane review produced last year about vitamin E in pregnancy, saying that they don't support the routine supplement of vitamin E, and there's no convincing evidence that vitamin E supplement um, will have any, import any beneficial benefits or harms. Um, there was also one on looking at vitamin C in the Cochrane review last year, and they say that there's no support to say that extra vitamin C will be of any benefit um, giving extra Multiple micronutrient supplements. At the moment, there's no UK standard advice to recommend universal multivitamin micronutrient supplementation. Um, there was a Cochrane review first published in 2006. It was updated last year, still saying there's insufficient evidence to support that, apart from the folic acid and the iron. Um, I also wanted to obviously mention the healthy start vitamins, which are available free during pregnancy until a child is one year old, which can, contains folic acid, vitamin C and vitamin D. But the, the main ones there obviously would be the folic acid and the vitamin D, the, the most benefits. I also wanted to mention the um, effects of restricted caffeine intake on um, fetal and neonatal and pregnancy outcomes. High caffeine intakes have been linked to fetal growth retardation. And again, just highlight to you the Cochrane Review that was published last year. At the moment, they're saying there's insufficient evidence to confirm or refute the effectiveness of caffeine avoidance during pregnancy on birth outcomes. However, in the, in the UK at the moment, we do recommend an intake of below 200 uh, milligrams a day in pregnancy. And that was evidence based on research that was published in 2008. And what they found was that there was a positive association between caffeine intake and increased risk of fetal growth restriction. Um, so that, the evidence is based on that. Um, future directions. I just wanted to highlight the WHO document to you in 2011 about the nutrition of women in the preconception period during pregnancy and the breastfeeding period. It's quite an interesting article to read. It's not very big, but it's quite interesting to read. Um, and what they're saying is that you include proven nutrition and health interventions with an impact on nutrition in the integrated management of pregnancy and childbirth. Um, and that this is, will raise quality and increase coverage of antenatal and postnatal care. What they're also saying that we need to have improved access to antenatal care of women with low socioeconomic status and other disadvantaged groups. And I'm sure of you that work in inner city Manchester will absolutely agree with that. And that we should be developing and disseminating a model food-based dietary guidelines for pregnant women. And I certainly think as a dietitian, we fully in support and endorse that as well. So it's quite a nice document, easy to read. But these are the, the recommendations that the WHO are saying that we should be looking at and raising the profile of to try and improve the nutrition of women in the preconception period during pregnancy and in breastfeeding. They're also saying that um, we should have some social marketing campaigns to advocate healthy nutrition in the preconception period. Because I still think, as health professionals, we maybe realise the importance, but I don't always think it's out there in the general public. And that women, you know, I think the message has got through about healthy eating during pregnancy, but I don't always think it's there that women maybe take much notice of the pre-pregnancy and preconception period. Maybe only those that are having difficulties with trying to get pregnant, but I think it's maybe an area that maybe we need to highlight more in the future. Um, and that we should be monitoring low birth weight, maternal undernutrition and obesity, and looking at weight gain in obese pregnant women. And these are areas that need to be highlighted more. And that we should be, have more guidance on the optimal weight gain during pregnancy. Um, and they're also highlighted monitoring maternal iron and folate status as well. So really, to, to summarise, um, there is adverse environments in fetal life and in early childhood that are led, leading to increased risk of disease in adult life. Um, and that can be you know, linked back to preconception um, nutrition in, in, the, in the mother. A healthy diet should be encouraged to ensure nutritional adequacy for maternal and fetal outcomes. Being underweight and overweight can affect pregnancy outcomes. Um, 
we know that the definite for no um, that folic acid should be taken preconception and up until the 12th week in pregnancy. And we also know that vitamin D supplements should be advised for all women throughout pregnancy and um, lactation. So those are the definite areas we definitely have the research for. Some of the other areas I've highlighted are, as I say, there's some bits that say, yes, we should, and some people say, no, we shouldn't, and we're not really sure. But for sure, vitamin D and folate, we definitely um, are agreed on that. Um, so just to, to find, quote with a final quote, and... Um, I'd like to probably change that to women. Um, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken women. So I think um, as a bit of a whirlwind tour of um, nutrition, preconception, pregnancy and lactation, I think there's lots of things that we do know, but I also think there's lots of things that we don't know and that we need further research and studies to look at. <laughs>